When I first stepped foot out of my mother's car and onto the freshly cut grasses of university, I had a very utopian idea of the reality of institutions of, of higher learning. I chuckle at the fact that although never audibly stated, I somehow believed that the visible transition of a tassel from the right to left quadrant of a high school graduation cap would somehow represent the internal transition of the, from the ignorance of childhood into the enlightenment of post-secondary education. The people would carry messenger bags instead of backpacks, write with quills instead of pencils, and go to the coffee shop instead of the library. All would understand the true nuances of society. And the quad, whatever that is, would serve as a place for intellectual inquiry and common ground. Clearly, my undying love for the sitcom A Different World did not serve me well in this regard. I was in for a rude awakening. In the spring semester of my freshman year, there was an event happening on campus one evening, hosted by a notably conservative political group that had scheduled a particularly controversial guest speaker to be the headliner. When some minority-led liberal student groups on campus caught word of this, they decided they would attend. And as a member of the student government, as well as a genuinely curious mind, I decided I would go as well. The room was still, yet chaotic all at the same time. One side of the room staffed with outraged liberal affiliates, the other stacked with self-identified conservative right-wing students. You could cut the tension with a knife. And although I don't wish to share my own political views with you this evening, I will say that I stayed. I stayed because I now had questions. I wondered how in an atmosphere of academia and reason such differing ideals could be produced. I stayed and spoke with members of different sides of the room, asking them why they felt so strongly in their positions. I stayed to find where the birthplace of this animosity resided, where the hatred began. And I was shocked to be greeted with the voices that I expected to inevitably dislike. Instead, I was met with other inquiring minds, desperate to know the truth, and find the breaking point in a flawed system. I have a confession to make. The topic for this talk this evening is a bit misleading for two reasons. The title, Civil Disagreement, A Dying Art, suggests that civil disagreement was once a thriving, living entity within our society. But I can in no way deny that ears have been cut off over minor disputes, food has been thrown, names have been called. But I would instead like to argue that civil disagreement as a discipline, as a school of thought, has always been an ideal. So how do we do this? We must first acknowledge that this talk is misleading for a second reason, too. You may be thinking to yourself, yes, now I can finally survive conversations at Thanksgiving with my controversial uncle. Or even, now I can avoid controversy and confrontation altogether. But I regret to inform you that the purpose of this talk is not to act as an anti-inflammatory supplement. But instead, I believe that in order to achieve this ideal, there is much to be confronted. Our pride, our intentions, our priorities, our regard for human dignity. So where do we begin? Immanuel Kant famously said, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, never merely as a means to an end, but always an end. Preventing incivility and conflict is a lot like preventing catastrophe, like a fire, for instance. Stop, drop, and roll. Beginning with our first step, stop assuming. It is imperative that we acknowledge that the person standing before me 
has their own individual story and has not been placed on this earth to serve as an extra in mine. The foundational ingredient of civil disagreement is not merely having an open mind or even listening. Instead, it's acknowledging that this person is their own range or scope of experiences that has brought them to this conversation. But it's difficult. It's hard to think to myself, the driver of this vehicle is indeed a human being that just cut me off in the middle of traffic. Sometimes I like to tell myself that their wife must be in the passenger seat going into labor, which would obviously inhibit their social graces and ability to operate heavy machinery. I say this in a comedic way, but it's true. It's our inclination to justify another person's existence merely by the role they play in supporting ours. In conversations of, about human development, this is often referred to as the adolescent ego. Like in the fourth grade when you saw your teacher at Safeway on a weekend and said, wow, who knew she liked Doritos? <laughs> or had a life outside of teaching me commas. It's important for us to recognize that before this conversation can be effective and meaningful, an important idea must be defined. Human dignity, the inherent unmerited value of every human person that cannot be dissolved under any circumstances. This theme is often the cornerstone of Catholic social thought, derived from the idea that every human person has been stamped with God's own likeness, or imago dei, or image of God. But this idea does not transcend, or does transcend rather, faith tradition or denominational identity. In conversations within the political arena, human dignity is often referred to as a constitutional right and lays the foundation for the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So why is this relevant for our conversation? Disagreement is a necessary art to master within the human experience. Diversity of opinion is crucial to our survival. If you were to ask a farmer, they would easily inform you that growing one crop alone leaves a community imbalanced and malnourished. But this is where we have a great opportunity. It is important for us to recognize that this moment, we must acknowledge step two, drop your defenses. In this moment, we have to acknowledge that this person sitting to the left or to my right, is not the opponent of vi or villain in my story either. In this moment, removing the demonization of those to my left or to my right does not only eliminate the competitive nature of our conversations, but the power structures that attempt to erect themselves between us. This disarms power dynamics in between child and parent, employee and employer, and student and educator. If you've ever stood at a picket line in the wake of two opposing demonstrations, you may recognize that the most meaningful or influential signs are not argumentative or even research-based. They're human. Leading us to our third and final step. Just roll with it. Here it is our responsibility as civil communicators to clarify our intentions. Am I communicating or competing? Am I speaking to educate or to win? Am I speaking from a place of fear or trust? The journey is the destination. Sharing space and dialogue is the art worth mastering. Whether or not you agree on the subject matter is secondary. This is not about them. This is about us. Here, we must acknowledge that this is an inside job. Stop assuming, drop your defenses, and just roll with it. Only then can disagreement be addressed and disaster be, avo be avoided. When we view people as people, as anxious to be heard as we, it won't be nearly as catastrophic when we find we disagree.
Thank you.